Hi, I'm Veronica Manuel, and I'm joined by music and technology expert, Dr. Matthias Roeder of the Carion Institute today. Uh, Matthias is the CEO of the Carion Institute, and today we are going to be talking about artificial intelligence and music. Matthias, thank you so much for speaking with me today. It's my pleasure. It's great meeting you, and I'm happy to be on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you've got your hands in both AI and music. Um, that's such a cool mix. Can you tell me um, how you got into these fields and how they overlap for you? Yeah, you know, I've been in music all of my life, really. I started playing the guitar when I was five years old um, and I loved it so much, you know, became very good very quickly. And um And then, you know, you get older and you start to have other interests as well. And for me, it was science and really, you know, understanding biology first. Uh, I was very interested in these biological networks that exist all around us. And then later on, because I wasn't allowed to have a computer on my own uh, back in the 80s, um, When I was old enough uh, and I had enough resources, I bought my own computer. And then I started coding right away and, you know, learning how to operate uh, and design databases. And that got me then interested in using data um, in networks um, and data specifically in music. And so uh, when I when I had finished my studies in classical guitar performance in Salzburg, Uh, I was invited to do a PhD at Harvard University, and it was there that I first uh, worked with uh, artificial neural networks um, and, you know, people from the computer science department who really knew um, that technology very well. But that was in the in the big AI winter around 2001, 2002. So everyone thought it was such a nut idea to be in artificial intelligence and music. Yeah, um, it seems so cool nowadays, and AI has really uh, become hip, but it didn't always used to be that way, and it really was for the nerds and the coders, and uh, it was kind of underground. Um, so I want to shatter some stereotypes here, because when people think of AI and music, their mind immediately goes to things like uh, electronic dance music, uh, techno, uh, other kinds of like Uh, electronic forms of music, um, you know, using the synthesizer and all that. Um, but you're an expert in classical music. So how does uh, AI kind of work with classical music? Well, it's it's really the same thing. Um, basically, um, you, you have different stages of making music. Um, you know, it starts with getting an inspiration, having, having an idea, then composing the music, then, you know, producing it or recording it, performing it. Those things are the same for any kind of musical genre, really. And um, the question is, where do you use AI in the process? Um, a lot of people are surprised uh, that uh, there is a lot of AI already in music production. Um, but um, we started to think about, can we use uh, artificial neural networks in composing? And specifically in composing music in a style of, you know, some of the great masters that uh, that have been around. And so um, what we specialized in early on was to say we learn the style of a particular composer. In our case, it was Ludwig van Beethoven. And um, we can then use the AI to compose music like he would have. Um, and that gave us a lot of interesting um, opportunities to play around with the technology. But in general, there's really no difference between the different genres, I would say. Um, that's pretty cool. I know that, uh, you know, we were going to gravitate toward this topic anyway, uh, but I do want to jump straight into Beethoven in uh, particular uh, before we touch on some other topics. Um, you know, you received an Effie Award for your project management in mm -hmm. composing with artificial intelligence Beethoven's 10th symphony, which mm -hmm. was unfinished but uh, started in the end of his lifetime. Um, You know, regarding this, uh, there was some controversy. Um, should an AI even complete an unfinished symphony? Uh, yeah, of course it should, because you want to uh, 
find out what the AI is capable of doing. And there's really no better use case in music than if you have a work that was begun by um, a great master and uh, wasn't finished, then you have the AI finish it. And if you can't tell the difference between what was written by the composer, um, what was sort of the beginning of his work, and then the end, which was done by AI, then you know, you basically um, have a Turing test like scenario. So um, it's a great example of, um, of using the technology. Cool. Um, you know, I took a listen to it and it is quite good. I am not quite as expert as some other listeners to be able to detect, you know, if there is any artificial or uh, synthetic kind of flavor to the composition, but it does to me sound very uh, realistic and convincing given what I have heard of Beethoven. So um, that part is is pretty cool. You have at least uh, one fan who was fooled by the AI. Uh, I would not have been able to tell the difference if uh, it was the real deal uh, versus AI. Um, so Along this note, uh, I guess pun intended, um, Beethoven started going deaf in his later years, um, mm -hmm. and that did affect his composition style. Uh, for example, I've read that he was favoring more bass tones uh, as he was losing his hearing. Um, does the AI weigh uh, the music data later in his life? So in other words, the composition style that he took later in his life, does that mm -hmm does the AI weigh it more heavily when it projects out what the 10th symphony would have sounded like if he were to finish it? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, we always say, does the AI do this or do that? Um, in fact, the AI is nothing without the humans who um, design it, who train it, who teach it, you know, who give it feedback. Um, and so in our case, we um, had a group of experts um, from the Beethoven House, um, from Harvard, from Rutgers University, from uh, Cambridge University. And we were looking at the scores that Beethoven left and we were thinking about um, uh, what kind of piece would he have uh, composed. Um, and there's an interesting thing. When you look at the late style Beethoven, uh, these works are typically um, of, you know, enormous proportion. They uh, are very uh, unlike one another. So each one is very different from the next. Um, and they are really, yeah, special. Um, when you look at the sketches for the 10th symphony, then you also see a very special kind of a composition in the works. Uh, but what's interesting is that Beethoven was actually referring to a lot of his older music, like music when he was young, um, classicistic models, which are sort of more, um, I'd say, in line with um, that time and the way that people were composing then. And so um, Beethoven was composing the 10th symphony while he was working on the 9th. And what you can see from the sketches is that he was really trying to do something super um, uh, different from the 9th. So uh, it's a surprising work in that it actually refers back to older styles of music. And, um, and so for us, the challenge was that, like you say, normally you would... Uh, weigh a lot the uh, later music in the training data set and in the training process. But in our case, we actually realized, well, he's trying to go back to earlier models. So we had to find a good balance for that. So it's all really a human machine interaction process and it's a iterative process. So it's really a team of AI and humans working together. Yeah, so um, just to, to further explore what you just said, um, mm -hmm. is it possible that Beethoven was feeling nostalgic because he was aware that he was approaching his later years, uh, do you think? Yeah, I mean, Beethoven at the end of his life was, um, you know, contemplating issues that, you know, of death, of um, eternal life, of... Um, of what he has achieved in life, you know, where he's coming from. And, and um, his illness, um, he, he was 
ill on many different levels. Um, it was not only that he had a hearing loss, he was really uh, a person who was suffering a lot in his uh, daily life. Uh, that played a role too. So, um, so these are all aspects that, um, that were in his head when he was composing the music. And um, uh, you, can, you can get a sense of what he was going through from listening also to some of his earlier works. Uh, which express a lot of of that, but I think in the case of the tenth, he wanted to actually um, maybe get a little bit away from all of that and go back to happier times. I, that's a fair way of putting it, I think. So, uh, in a nutshell, you think that it was nostalgic, but in a happy way, rather than like a sorrowful style yeah. of composition. Exactly. Well, you see that a lot in some of the uh, other compositions. Uh, of the time, they have these moments of uh, great joy and um, bliss almost, and um, those are really special moments. And I think he was looking for that in the 10th uh, as well. Sorry, uh, I don't want to pick on this uh, for too long because there are some other things I want to ask you about. But, uh, I, you know, you really uh, make me curious here. Is it possible to quantify or objectively measure sadness versus joy in music and what does that look like because I really don't have any concept of how you would classify a certain patterns as joyful versus sad mm -hmm. yeah that's a really great question um, when you think about music then uh, and emotion um, I think what you, you have to see is that the emotion that music creates um, is being created in the listener, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's created by skillful use of certain patterns that uh, we have come to understand create certain sensations in listeners. So you it's kind of like knowing um, a language very well and understanding what kinds of emotions will a certain phrase evoke in my conversation partner. And uh, musicians are very good at um, playing with these um, patterns. They can be rhythmic patterns, they can be melodic patterns or harmonic patterns. And so um, a lot of what music does is uh, skillfully mixing these patterns to create a desired effect. That's one, on one level of music making. There's also an artistic level. Um, there's um, also a technical level to it. but. On the emotional level, it's really the mix of these patterns. And um, I often get the question, well, an AI hasn't suffered, an AI cannot uh, have emotions, so how can it actually create any kind of emotional music? Well, it does because it knows these patterns as well, and it knows them much better than most of us. Mm -hmm. And so um, for an AI, this is actually nothing special to do. It's a question of um, statistical um, distribution of patterns within a composition that makes it, you know, sound um, um, appropriate and sound good. And then it's a question of how you actually use the AI um, uh, in, in specific cases um, to create emotional music uh, in one direction or the other. So I do believe that um, uh, the answer is in the patterns in the music and the emotions are then evoked in the listener. Yeah, I actually have made a little bit of music for Ocean using AI, uh, especially for the YouTube videos. And I did see that you could create from a seed uh, different kinds of songs. And those seeds would say like, you know, upbeat or uplifting. And then some of them uh, weren't really emphasizing the sad tones. But if I searched for you know, a uh, sad violin, you know, I'm sure that I could find a, a template for that. I was mostly looking for the happy stuff. Uh, but I did always kind of like wonder how, how does that uh, get coded? Um, and so it sounds like it really is a pattern recognition that the AI is doing and then is, um, you know, offering that up in a, in a song that it creates. Um, yeah, that, yep. that, that it brings me to this curiosity uh, that I have about pop music. Mm -hmm. So it's known that corporations are uh, famous for putting their pop songs through a algorithm that will determine how viral or how catchy it will be. Along this note uh, that uh, you said that there are certain patterns that can elicit emotions, just like 
by the same token that there are patterns that could be super catchy uh, mm -hmm. from the get-go. Is AI influencing our top 40 hits too much? And what do you think of mm -hmm. pop music nowadays? Yeah, that's also a great question. Um, I actually wanted to add something to the previous um, part sure. of our conversation before answering this one. Okay. Um, when you when you think about these AIs where you can say, well, I want to have this song in sad or in happy and so on. Right now, a lot of this is done um, on, on sort of the level after the generation. It filters um, the generated music for certain um, characteristics. But if we think about the future um, or the near future, then I believe that we can do a lot with the training data set it itself. So right now, if we train an AI for music, we actually train it on the notes only, right? On, on the music only. But what if we had a training data set that would say like this piece of music uh, and then there is emotional reaction of uh, 100 listeners to that particular piece of music and maybe a description of the um, emotional content of the music, and you use that for training purposes, then the AI will gain an intuitive understanding of all of this emotional content in music. And this is going to be, um, you know, magnitudes uh, more effective than what we typically see in an off-the-shelf uh, product right now. So, so there's still a lot of stuff that can be done on the research level uh, to improve our music AIs. We're really, really just at the very beginning of, of this journey. Um, as for the top 40 uh, hits in, in, in the pop world, um, I mean, there is so much technology involved in composing uh, these pieces, producing them, distributing them, getting to you as a listener. Um, and a lot of that technology, when it first came out, was called AI. Now we wouldn't call it AI anymore. But uh, when you um, master a track, right, there are algorithms at work which are uh, really um, responsive to what's in the music to make it ideal, uh, the mix, uh, things like this. So there is already a lot of AI in this music. Um, as for composing, I know that... Um, artists are exploring right now and um, they are incorporating a lot uh, of the new technology. Um, I do think that in the top 40, it's probably not as common yet um, as, as it could be, but we're definitely uh, getting to a point where it will not be even considered a valid question to ask, is there AI in this piece of music? Because it, be, it will be used by everyone in the, in the foreseeable future. I'm sure of that. Yeah. And so I, on a philosophical note, uh, just want to ask you, is it in your opinion, uh, maybe do we lose something when we generate catchy songs in pop music? Do we lose something or maybe forego a more complex or curious, um, element of music like mm -hmm. is it is it a bad thing that songs are too catchy like what do we sacrifice when we use ai to make a song viral or very uh, deliberately emotional yeah look um it's like with everything in life take food for instance um you know if you take a, a, a ice cream you know with artificial flavors and a lot of sugar you try it and the first second you're like, whoa, this tastes so well. But um, as the sensation goes away, you know, you're left with a little bit of um, emptiness in your, on your taste buds, right? right? And the question is, what are you looking for? Do, are you looking for the quick fix or are you looking for a sustained experience? And now you can say, well, that's a great argument for not using AI in composition, but you could also say, well, um, if I as an artist start to develop my own AI and I really care about how it works and what it can do to enhance my musical compositions, then it becomes really this challenging tool that uh, helps me improve my art and then hopefully also uh, helps me improve um, the enjoyment for my fans. So it's it's a question of how you really use these tools. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the same in music, in text, in images. Uh, 
at the end of the day, the question is, what do we actually do with it? And what is our intention as humans? Yeah, so uh, I'm sure some of the questions that were in philosophy uh, philosophical angles that we're exploring now are similar to what happened when synthesizers uh, were fresh on the scene. And so it is curious because there could be a debate about whether or not that that kind of uh, music is real music. And I, I, I wanted to ask your opinion because, for example, you are trained in classical guitar uh, or, or you know how to play classical guitar. And then you've been uh, trained quite a bit in, uh, I'm sure, music theory and um, how to how to play the instrument better. Is it, in your opinion, necessary to be able to play an instrument in real life to truly understand that art of music generation? No, not at all. Uh, I think, um, you, you know, music is something that is being created in your brain. Um, and uh, it's something that uh, can be exercised purely without having ever touched an instrument. Uh, you would have to um, spend a lot of time really singing um, internally for yourself and really getting accustomed to the music. But it's not necessarily, uh, it's not necessary to play an instrument. I think it is a faster way to, to come to a certain level of proficiency, but it's not necessary uh, at all. It's like, um, do you have to um, have a computer to be able to program? It's the same question. No, you don't. I mean, you can purely develop programs uh, in your head on a piece of paper without using a computer. And uh, when someone will then input them into a computer, they will work or not but uh, it's not necessary for you to use the computer actually. Yeah, I myself as a coder uh, in the past have heard these stories of, um, for example, in emerging economies where there's not great access to computers or the internet, that people will code uh, or program on paper and yeah. uh, then when they get a chance to use a computer, run their program, on the computer and then see how it runs. And actually, I have heard uh, in these stories that it can make for better coders when you actually write down your steps and then you debug it because there's so much on the line when you actually gain access to the computer. It, it's a rare opportunity, so you don't want your code to fail. Uh, so you check it and double check it and make sure that it's optimized yep. and all that. Um, you know, when, where, yeah. when we were kids um, and and I'm telling this story because you are much younger so it, it must have been different um, we essentially we learned uh, coding um, in basic that was the name of the language uh, from magazines you basically you, you bought a magazine and it would show you the, the lines of codes would give you comments and then you would know what the program would do and and you would start to develop your own programs on paper, like you say. And then when you are in front of the computer at your friend's house, you type it all in and see if it works. Um, and that's that was also the case later on when the big research computers uh, were developed. Then if you were a researcher, you had very little time at the machine itself. So, um, you know, you better come prepared. Yeah. And I yeah. Think you know, Weird. That, I had no idea about the magazines. Um, yeah. That, that is, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> um, and now they're textbooks, right? But in college, like we, for the most part, didn't code on paper. Our assignments were mostly submitted digitally. They either yeah. ran or they didn't, you know, or it would sometimes be possible to get like partial credit if you had some of the algorithmic logic in there uh, properly. But, um, you know, it, it's still far away from reading a magazine and then having limited access to inputting your your stuff in a computer you can fail faster i mean um, the learn a different way when you fail faster running your code and then seeing it break and fixing and fixing um you know, you know it's so um for 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 our brain it's so uh, important to be able to internally represent something that doesn't exist in the real world. This is how we actually um, create a lot of things. And um, uh, by doing this deliberately, you actually become much better at what you are trying to achieve. For instance, when we were practicing um, classical guitar uh, during our uh, studies, 
we would take a new piece of music that we had never played before. We would sit down, we would study the score without ever touching the instrument. We would sit down and close our eyes and think about how am I actually going to play this? Which finger goes where? How does it feel? What will it sound like? And then uh, after a day or two of doing this, which is almost like a meditative kind of work, you can go on stage and you can play the piece. First time ever. And it works. It's a, it's a question of how well do you train your mind to be in an alternative state. And I think this is a, a, a super important power to have in anything you do, you know. You see sports people do it a lot when you see uh, uh, race car drivers. They sit, they go through the track in their head without actually running it. Um, it's, it's mental preparation and it makes everything easier. And it's the same for, for any kind of activity that we do, I think. Yeah, you know, I had never considered uh, that pre-playing either music or, you know, I, I, of course, have some experiences where I mentally thought something out before I did it, like lifting a heavy weight. Um, <laughs> you know, I prepare myself sometimes mentally, you know, going through the motion without the weight and then putting it on. That way I'm not shocked uh, when Thank I put the heavy weight on, but that's nothing as complex as doing uh, actual uh, performing music. Um, you know, because you're talking about creativity and the importance of being able to run something through your mind and then actualize it in real life, um, you have um, this experience in research uh, and creating the Sonophilia Foundation um, to promote creative thinking. So what does research show us uh, that you've seen about creativity uh, and creative thinking in other fields? How does music affect your creative thinking in other fields? Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe a couple of myths about creativity um, uh, are that you're either born creative or you're not, you know, that it's sort of a talent. Uh, that is not true. Uh, creativity, first of all, all humans um, um, are creative when they are born. Uh, that's that's our sort of single most important survival uh, skill. Mm -hmm. um, and you can actually train creativity. So um, if you feel like you're not creative enough, um, there are ways for you to actually become very creative. And it's a question of practice. Uh, the other thing is that um, creativity is somehow opposed to um, scientific uh, thinking, rationality, uh, sort of you've maybe heard about the left brain, right brain um, right thinking. Uh, yeah. That's also a myth. It's not true. Uh, what happens when we are creative in any kind of field, it could be artistic, it could be science, it could be language, whatever it is, um, we are using a lot of different parts of our brain. And um, the executive network, which is uh, sort of um, uh, coordinating what our brain does is also heavily involved in in creative uh, thinking so creativity is just um, uh, a, an extraordinarily important skill especially in our time i believe and it's something that we can train that also means that we can actually design our institutions our way of working uh, our schools, our curricula around this idea. And we're not doing that enough yet. And the Sonophilia Foundation is trying to support neuroscientific research into creativity and then go out and tell the world about what can be done to actually enhance creativity. And, and this is true in, in any field that, that uh, you can think of. Um, and music is, of course, one part of it. Um, the, the person who maybe exemplified this approach to creativity the most uh, in the 20th century is uh, Herbert von Karajan, a great uh, Austrian conductor, who was also extremely interested in how music affects the body and the mind. So he put together a research institute to study exactly what happens within us when we listen to music, when we make music. And the goal was to to help more people uh, get great enjoyment out of music, be either become musicians themselves or enhance their experience when they listen to music. And so Von Karajan was one of the big pioneers in that field to use technology to enhance music uh, perception. Um, and um, he's, he is um, the big shining example of, of what uh, 
people are trying to do in that field. Um, for me personally, um, I believe it is really important that everyone who listens to this podcast um, understands that they are super creative and they have the power to, to um, be even more creative. It's a question of approach and it's a question of allowing yourself to be a creative person. Yeah, you know, um, that is very inspiring to hear. And I as well um, doubt my own ability to be creative, especially compared to a musician or compared mm -hmm. to a painter. You know, I think um, it's easy to feel if you work in a you know professional sense that maybe you're not as creative as, some, as someone who makes it their entire profession to be creative, but uh, to not lose that inner child or uh, the ability to create uh, or imagine new things would also make it very difficult to work. So just recognizing when we're being creative might help uh, to inspire confidence in ourselves. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, a lot of people say um, that there is this famous book, I, I forgot who wrote it, but it's uh, called Start With Why, you know, always ask yeah. why. I think um, it's Simon Sinek. Yeah, exactly. That's him. And it's a great book. It's a great author, a uh, very inspiring person and has done a lot uh, to, to inspire many people. But I think you can also um, write a book uh, that says, start with why not? You know, if you just ask yourself why not, um, then you open up for a lot of possibilities and you don't limit yourself by convention. You don't limit yourself by your own uh, view of yourself. Uh, and that's very empowering. And um, so I always say when whatever it is you're doing and you have an idea and then you feel like, well, maybe it's not good enough or maybe it's not the right way to do it. Just ask yourself, why not? And, and give it a try. It's very simple, but powerful. Yeah, you know, I had in the back of my mind a question when you were talking about creativity and uh, music composition, like there are certain in real life limitations to our ability to create patterns, right? When you're playing guitar, there's only so far that your fingers can reach to create chords and melodies, right? Um, so in the sense of using AI, it would be possible or uh, electronic means it would be possible to escape the limitations of human generated music, but then how would that really change the music? Would we still like it? You know, would it be familiar to us or not uh, to the point where we dislike it? Um, so it is interesting to think uh, in your bent to say to yourself, well, why not create music out of the realm of what we're used to hearing, what might be enjoyable, because then there's some kind of explore, exploration that's valuable in and of itself there. Um, yes. Yeah, so it's weird as we escape the physical reality, how we can then get in touch with the creativity that's latent in the mind mm -hmm. and express it in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it'll be interesting, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the effect of studying music's emotional um, I guess, manipulation, right? Uh, on, on an individual, I know that the Karyan Institute is doing this kind of research from the very beginning. And mm -hmm. that's super cool. Um, I am really glad you gave more context on it, because I, I feel that you gave more context outside of what I could read on the website. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's really cool. I didn't know spiritually or philosophically that that element of studying um, music was there. But um, when people get these augmented reality or virtual reality headsets put on, and then there's like this pupil tracking, you know, pupil dilation, heart rate uh, tracking, then, you know, sound effects and music will have a very measurable impact on the psyche. And mm -hmm. uh, it might be curious to see what the Karyon Institute studies with mm -hmm. respect to um, the emotional state of an individual uh, when that, uh, it, when they're, pupils and heart rate are, are, are measured as mm -hmm. they're listening to music. So I wonder uh, maybe if that's quite far in the future, but if that might be something that uh, the Institute might be interested in, in, in looking at. 
Sounds very interesting. I, you might have well just uh, planted an idea in my head what we should be doing next. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think that the, uh, the field of, let's call it uh, extended reality, um, virtual reality, is very interesting. It's also something that is, we are only at the very beginning. Um, I mean, it still feels a little bit strange to put on these goggles. You do it only in certain uh, situations. So um, uh, it could make for a very interesting um, use case for a scientific study. And maybe there's already uh, studies out there who are looking at this. What we are right now interested in at the Kalyan Institute is to uh, find ways to really reach new audiences for uh, classical music in particular mm -hmm. um, and use technology for that. Uh, we are very much investigating right now how we can create AIs that actually perform music. So um, you give it a, a piece of music and can it perform in the style of Herbert von Karajan, for instance? Um, can, can we um, create tools that assist us in um, performing music? Um, that's one aspect that we're looking at. Other things that we're looking at is we're just producing a lot of content for um, podcasts like this one, for instance, where we talk about music, certain stories within the music, and then people can enjoy listening to the music. So we basically give context for, for the music. Um, we have a conference, the Karaya Music Tech Conference, which is all about uh, news technologies and music. And uh, that happens once a year in Salzburg. We try to really get like the latest uh, that you can find in research and, and um, startups to, to come to Salzburg. So if you want to take a glimpse into what can come next in, in music and technology, then that's your place to be. Um, there's so many, many great things one can do in music. We can't do it all by ourselves. Um, resources are always limited. But that's why um, having communities is so important. And um, we try to reach out. So if there are any, um, you know, technology uh, nerds who have a fantastic idea about what can be done with classical music, they should definitely be in touch. And we uh, will try to match you with others who have similar interests, or maybe we'll do something together um, with you. Um, so reach out and we're here. Yeah, you know, we do a lot of tokenization of data on chain, but yeah. a lot of people don't realize that data can be almost anything, you know, images are data uh, that ultimately can be stored at a binary uh, in binary code. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can also have this uh, same appreciation for music, which can be represented uh, as well as, uh, you know, we know them as MP3 files, right, uh, uh, digitally, but essentially that is data. Um, and we actually um, have a template where you can use our smart contracts to be able to tokenize uh, mm -hmm. music and then also uh, create a music marketplace. Uh, so in that sense, if you were an individual composing your own music and digitizing it and tokenizing it on chain, you could sell your own music uh, to other individuals around the world for crypto, um, you know, and, and eventually maybe for fiat as well. Uh, but side skirting that the middlemen of, you know, Apple Music or Spotify, for example, and truly having the sovereignty over your own data. Uh, and in this case, music being that data. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's cool. And you could have your own record label, um, you know, where you and your friends uh, are on one market. And uh, so you pool uh, and get a larger audience than maybe just one band or one individual, right? Um, um, you know so, yeah, that, that we have that tech uh, currently. Yeah. But as far as, uh, you know, talking about a collab, um, that would be really cool as well. We have uh, the tech chops to uh, help support, um, you know, some of this uh, exploration of the intersection of AI and uh, helping you guys at the Karyan Institute with, with music. I, I would love to explore a collaboration there. Um, yes. But we can talk outside of the podcast a little bit more about what that would look like. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I have so many questions. Um, you know, there, there's questions about music. Um, there's questions um, about um, composition, 
AI that I have. Um, I, I want to keep it, um, you know, concise as possible because you have a busy schedule. Our listeners probably also uh, have a busy schedule. Um, you know, what are some musicians, uh, either AI composing musicians or just musicians that you love uh, on a personal level that you would recommend to our viewers to take a listen to? So uh, maybe two names. Uh, one is take a listen uh, to uh, Robbie Williams' new album. It has a song called Angels in a version that was co-composed by our Beethoven AI. So it's going to be a Beethoven-like version of Robbie Williams' Angels. That's a cool thing. Um, and Robbie was one of the first uh, artists, you know, of the big stars to actually play around with AI. So um He, he's a big hero of mine for doing that. Um, the other person that I personally uh, enjoy listening to a lot is Holly Herndon. Holly is um, an amazing artist. She has been working with machine learning uh, algorithms and with other technology for many, many years already. Uh, so she's a true pioneer and she has developed her own AI system, Holly Plus. Um, and she's uh, actually also very engaged in the blockchain space. So if you haven't checked her out yet, she is the one to really uh, rush towards and, and listen to everything that Holly does. Cool. Yeah. And there's a lot to be explored there uh, with respect to the, the blockchain and uh, music besides just tokenizing uh, music and, and, and monetizing it, like truly yeah. representing that music uh, on the blockchain. Um Yeah. Yep. So, um, you know, right. on this note, uh, because I, I find this uh, very valuable when I listen to podcasts and I, I find that these questions are kind of popular, um, you know, along the vein of what um, content that you like to consume and that you recommend. Um, what about books or movies about music that you like uh, or would like to recommend to our viewers to check out? Oh, that's a good one. Um movies about music um that's really hard because uh, i i like to i like to watch documentaries about music mm -hmm. um i think uh there is and it has nothing to do with ai really but there is a documentary you can find it on youtube it's about the amen break it's called it's a it's a rhythmic pattern that was used in a lot of music was used for sampling and it kind of created uh, later on jungle and all of these uh, kinds of um, uh, electronic um, uh, genres and that's that's a historical look into how this goes back into yeah this, the the music of the 60s i think This comes from there. So that's super, super interesting. Uh, books about music, um, that's, that's, really, that's really hard for me to say because I'm a music scholar, so which one should I single out? Yeah. I mean, it, it really depends on what you're interested in. I think um, a great book um, about music is... Um, Uh, uh, don't, I don't remember the title. It's written by uh, Oliver Sacks. He uh, was a neuroscientist and he studied um, um, also the effect of music on the human brain. And um, his book is really fantastic. Um, I also like to read biographies of musicians. And um, there is a book by Lewis Lockwood on um, Ludwig van Beethoven, which is great, or Christoph Wolf on uh, J.S. Bach. So these are um, historical books about the persons behind the music. Uh, I, I think those are excellent books. And, and what is the value of reading a biography on a musician? Is it the emotional element that they put into the music? Or is there some other factor in there that you find really entertaining? Well, for me, what's so interesting is, is how does music get created within the social um, reality of the time, right? Huh. I mean, um, uh, what are sort of the ways in which music was um, distributed, in which music was actually, how, what kind of music could you perform at the time, right? It all depends on the instruments you have, for instance. Uh, at the time of Bach, um, the organ that you find in churches, this was the loudest instrument on earth, 
and it was the uh, most sophisticated instrument. And so what did people feel when they were listening to a church organ played by one of these um, uh, great musicians? And, um, and, you know, to look at their music from this perspective for me is really interesting because it's always about understanding the limitations of the time and then having a new appreciation of what they did. And, and then when, when you think about your own time, what are the limitations that we have today? And what are the limitations, the boundaries that we have to push? Um, so this is, this is the stuff that I find uh, very interesting. Yeah, you know, I, I had not thought about the social element around creating music. I think that we touched a little bit on the possible negative self-talk that we have about creativity, maybe that uh, we limit ourselves based on maybe we don't think that we can create good music and what really is good music. And is that these patterns that already exist or uncharted territory? Um, mm -hmm. So in that sense, you know, we are social creatures. We want to, I think, or are inclined to create music that other people like. And then we feel uh, maybe that we judge ourselves based on the perception of the music that we create. Um, but at the same time uh, that there is value in just exploring, noodling, right, on the guitar um, or with whatever instrument that there is. Um, thank you so much for mm -hmm. um, your very thoughtful analysis on all things music and AI. I had a really uh, good time speaking with you, and I, I really feel like I got some uh, valuable gems of knowledge in there. Um, mm -hmm. And I certainly uh, can walk away with a lot of respect for the Karyon Institute's work. Uh, so um, thank you for leading um, such a great effort there. And I hope to see some cool projects from you guys in the future. Absolutely, Veronica. The pleasure was all mine. I always love interacting with uh, Ocean, um, and uh, it's a gr great group of people. Um, uh, Trent uh, and Bruce, I know from long time ago, and they 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 together with you guys are really pushing the boundary, and that's that's what I love. Well, we're all trying, right? Uh, and so um, you know, the future is uh, very exciting, especially with music on the radar there. Um, thank you so much. Guys, if you enjoyed what you saw or you thought maybe we should have covered other topics that you were curious about, go ahead and leave a comment below. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more content like this in the future.